Wales is one of the fattest countries in Europe. 59% of us are obese or overweight. And guess what? <clears throat> that includes me. Obesity costs the Welsh NHS over £73 million every year. So why have we become fat? After all, we've had lots of advice over the years. We should eat more non-fatty foods like bread, pasta and potatoes. But what if that government advice has been wrong all these years? We are now basing our guidelines on some very dated and poor research. Now have a look at this roast. Would you say this is healthy? And what about now? Well, according to a controversial new report, this really is the healthy option. It's good. So apparently fat is fine. There is no convincing evidence that makes saturated fat with heart disease. It's carbs which are the real killer. Carbohydrate at the end of the day is just sugar. I'm going to take my life and my belly in my hands and go on this controversial low-carb, high-fat diet, despite warnings from the medical establishment. Honestly, I think you're probably going to cause more harm to your belly than good. Is it time to cut the carbs and fill up on fat? Now, I'm no stranger to diets. Three years ago, I gave up sugar. I went on a traditional diet and exercise regime where I ate less and exercised more. I've reduced alcohol. I've replaced my nightly carbohydrate fix with a healthy alternative. And it worked. I lost a stone and a half. But I have to come clean. I may have put just a little back on. <laughs> Wales has an obesity epidemic. So when a group of health professionals published a report that challenged the government dietary guidelines and proposed that a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet could be the answer, I wanted to investigate. Thank you very much. Now, the idea of this diet is to get most of my energy intake from foods high in fat, such as meat, fish and dairy products. Rather than what the government guidelines suggest, which is a strict limit on fat, they endorse a higher proportion of starchy carbohydrates like bread, pasta and potatoes. Dr Zoe Harkham is a great advocate of the low-carb, high-fat diet, so what are the ingredients for success? What I wanted to show you here is what 25 grams of carb looks like, and that's what we're going to be trying to get you to do over the next two to three weeks. And why does 25 grams of carb matter? Why that quantity? It's, yeah, it's taking you down to your carb intake being about 5% of your energy intake, but it's just to give you an idea of how little it is of certain foods and how much you can get of other foods. Um, this, for example, would be 25 grams of carbohydrate in the form of rice. And if you like pasta... I do like pasta. Um, that's your pasta allowance, I'm afraid, if you choose to take your carb intake in the form of pasta. Goodbye spaghetti carbonara and spaghetti bolognese. Yeah, and... you're getting the idea. Sunflower oil and olive oil, lard, butter, these things do not contain carbohydrates. You're saying lard is OK? Lard is fine. It's goodbye to the starchy things that the government tell us to base our meals on. So the good news is that we're going to serve you some pork and crackling and that is what you're going to be able to eat in unlimited quantities. Oh my goodness. That looks lovely, isn't yeah. it? Crackling, which is fat, yes. which is good fat. Any fat found in real food is good fat. There's only one bad fat and that's the one made in factories. It's called trans fats. So fat that comes from an animal or plants or, or vegetables are good. Fats that come from factories, bad. Pretty much. It smells absolutely wonderful. Uh, I wouldn't normally have all that amount of crackling, but it looks absolutely wonderful. Uh, lots of greens. I usually wouldn't have that many greens. I'm not a huge fan of the greens, but um, I know I'm going to have to fill up on them. Ordinarily, I wouldn't have this much butter with my food, but here goes. good but if it tastes good will it do me good in life nothing is usually that simple by the way don't try this at home unless like me you first see your doctor dr marina rulanandam is my gp so it's time for some tests to see if i'm fit enough to start this diet experiment your test results have come back okay 
uh, EU going to live, yeah. which is very good. Yeah. You're not pregnant, which is even better. Even better. Good. That is good news. You can tell a lot from blood, can't you? Absolutely. It's very impressive. Absolutely. Okay, so your cholesterol, your total cholesterol is 5.6. So that's slightly higher than we'd expect it to be. According to the guidelines, it should be anything between 4 and 5 would be acceptable. So it's slightly over where slightly it should over. be. Slightly over. But I'm not too concerned about you embarking on this diet. Okay. But I've got to reiterate that it's got to be very short term. Three weeks, that's the plan. I'm going to do it for three weeks. Fine. Okay. The other thing to remember is, yes, you're doing this diet for three weeks. Don't go overboard and think, okay, wow, I'm having a high-fat diet. I can eat lots of cream and lots of red meat. And, you know, I can put cream into all my sauces. Just be a little bit sensible about what you're doing. Okay? You know the risks with high fats. My doctor has cautiously agreed to my body experiment, but as expected, she's concerned about my arteries. Surely a high-fat diet can't be good for my heart. A prominent supporter of the benefits of this diet is the London cardiologist, Dr. Asim Malhotra. There is no convincing evidence that links saturated fat with heart disease. I wanted to ask him if he thought it was safe for me to do this diet. The evidence is very clear. Dietary fat does not clog the arteries. What's driving this is refined carbohydrates, too much sugar. I've treated thousands of people with heart disease over my career. And what I tell them is that they should follow what I call evidence-based scientific studies that tell you the best diets for heart health, which is what I would say is a high-fat Mediterranean diet. So that means at the base, it means lots of vegetables, green vegetables. It means nuts. It means olive oil, oily fish. It means cutting out the refined carbohydrates and added sugars. See them as a treat, but not part of a healthy diet. So the fat that clogs up a patient's heart, the kind of patients you see every day, you're saying that fat comes from carbs. Well, what's interesting is when you look at the latest uh, data, and a lot of policymakers, even nutritionists, scientists have not fully appreciated this. When you look at the saturated fats in the blood that are correlated with heart disease and type 2 diabetes, the ones that are driving that, you know, produced by the liver, are sugar, starch, alcohol. So that is what we need to be concentrating on. It is not caused by dietary fats. Well, you couldn't get a much stronger endorsement than that, but this does fly in the face of a lot of the dietary guidance we've all heard for a generation. Plus, if a cardiologist says my arteries will be fine, on with the experiment. My first day on this diet starts with breakfast. Bacon and egg fried in real butter, but no bread. I thought I'd miss eating toast and eating cereal, um, but I don't really. The South Wales Valleys are the epicentre of the Welsh obesity epidemic. I'm in Ebervale to meet Wales' foremost obesity expert and advisor to the Welsh Government, Professor Nadim Hububi, who advocates a low-fat diet, the opposite of what I'm trying. I'm embarking on an experiment <coughs> to undertake uh, a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet for three oh weeks. Really? Do you approve? Of course not. Why? Losing weight is never impossible. You go on any diet, you will lose the weight. Sustainability is the most important, and weight maintenance. Maintain weight loss. And I am certain from experience uh, that you cannot sustain that. High fat diet have risk factor. Uh, very low carbohydrate also have its complication and adverse effect. This is something we discourage actually in, in, in this center, in this clinic. Uh, we think that people should count their calories, we think people should be on low fat diet, uh, they should be on complex carbohydrate, not very low, not high either, and they should have adequate protein intake. It's a simple equation, there's no magic about you know, obesity, it's just simply we are inactive. It's, it's amazing how, how much we have changed, how much the society has changed. So your advice to me embarking on this experiment is? Waste of time. And honestly, I think you're probably going to cause more harm to your body than good. 
Well, that's not really what I wanted to hear. I meet with Paul Hinwood, one of his patients. I was working 70 plus hours a week, um, just grabbing food when I could, drinking too much, not doing enough exercise because I was constantly at work. So how much weight have you lost? Um, well, I've gone from 230 kilograms down to 213. And that's just from seeing Dr. Habubi and his team and using some diet pills and just eating healthily. There's lots of arguments in the diet world, isn't there, yeah. as to what the right diet is. Uh, and almost whoever you speak to contradicts the last person. But when I started seeing the weight management team, they told me the facts, the way it was and how it should be. There's, there's so many different diets and everything out there. And so much conflicting advice off people. You've got to take a, as much as it on board as you can, weigh up your odds, and go for the one you think is the best. Well, that's sound advice. Although I must admit, I'm starting to find it a little confusing. Though one thing is clear, the medical establishment is pretty reluctant to buy into this diet. But some doctors are now recommending it to their patients. The only one I can find in Wales is GP Dr. Angharad Powell. I think that we've got the dietary guidelines wrong. A report from a few years ago showed that about 58% of adults were overweight, 22% of adults were obese. You can imagine that a GP's workload is very much skewed towards people with obesity and associated um, chronic diseases. You know, my view is that much of of that workload, much of that kind of morbidity could be prevented with a change in our approach to, to diet. It's difficult when we talk about protein and fats and carbohydrates, what does that mean in terms of food? And I agree entirely. And I think, you know, there are a few phrases that people find helpful. One of them is banish the beige. I, I quite like that one because it means cutting out bread, it's cutting out pasta, it's cutting out uh, potatoes and um, processed foods. I think people imagine with a high-fat diet that you're eating a stick of butter with a couple of nuts on the side. That isn't what I eat. The high-fat is in relation to the proportions to the other nutrients, the carbohydrate and the protein. This isn't going to be for everybody, and this isn't for all the patients I see. But certainly, I think we should be offering it as part of the suite of options to patients as opposed to a kind of dietary dogma that we all kind of know as individuals doesn't work, but we just think that it's us that went wrong. But I don't think we could have all gone wrong. So what do Dr. Powell's patients make of her unorthodox advice? Catherine Johnson has been on the low-carb, high-fat diet for nine months since she found out she had type 2 diabetes. There are things that are vital for us in order for us to live, and carbohydrates aren't on that list. My blood sugar has come down from 19.5, which was dangerously high, um, and it's now average is at 5, 5.5, which is pre-diabetic. So it, I have halted my diabetes. And your weight's dropped off. Yeah, that, and that was the happy side effect, that I lost, lost two and a half stone. Um, but physically, it's so much more than just that. Before I found that by two in the afternoon I was tired and I needed to nap, I'd, I'd begun to feel fuzzy, that as though some days as though I was underwater, as though my head just wouldn't clear and I couldn't think as straight. Whereas now I've got a lot more energy. My thinking is sharper. I feel, I feel back to the way I was. I hadn't realized I'd changed until I came back to how I used to be. People want a magic bullet. They want a magic tablet because it's easier. People don't want to have to make the changes. That's a, that's a frightening thing for people to do. This diet has clearly worked for Catherine. So it's going to be interesting to see how it works for me. So far, so good. I've kept a food diary the last seven days. My new life is uh, breakfast of bacon and eggs, steak and veg for lunch, uh, chicken breast uh, for tea. Uh, brunch on Saturday was fish, ham, veg, salad. And, um, well, you get the picture. It's a completely new life. None of my usual potatoes, uh, chips, uh, bread, toast, sandwiches. No alcohol at all. And the upshot is I started this experiment weighing 14 and a half stone. I weighed myself this morning and after seven days I weigh 14 stone. So I've lost half a stone. So this works. Having said that, Professor Habubi did say that if you go on any diet you will lose weight. But to keep up with my experiment, I do have to widen my repertoire in the kitchen. I'm in Pontypool to meet a cafe owner who says 
he reversed his type 2 diabetes diagnosis by ignoring GP advice, researching online, and losing weight on the low-carb, high-fat diet. Let's see if Mark Gregory has some recipe ideas for me. I've done this for a week now, and I could see that um, the menu could get uh, slightly predictable, so I'm in need of inspiration. Talk me through some uh, breakfast ideas. Eggs are nature's multivitamin. Lots of eggs. Omelette for breakfast, why not? Frittata. Lunch. Actually, I don't bother. Because, you know, I, I don't feel hungry. One thing I've learned is you can go without. The idea is you start burning your body fat, so I skip a meal, it doesn't hurt. What about dinner? Bolognese, meat sauce, if you like, but we chuck in all the vegetables, serve it with rice cauliflower. So when the punters come in here and that they, they want something from their favorite cafe, um, you, you sound like the sort of the preacher man behind the till. I won't preach, but I think, you know, if the government are allowed to push their version of a healthy diet, then I'm allowed to tell people if they want to know what, what choices they should be making. And it is all about choices. Think about your diet. Making choices. It's a valid point. Why is the low carb, high fat diet not widely offered as an option for those trying to lose weight? Back in May, two non profit organizations, the Public Health Collaboration and the National Obesity Forum, released a report that directly challenged the UK government's current dietary advice. Samuel Feltham is the director of the Public Health Collaboration and one of the key people behind this controversial report. You are going against received medical wisdom, aren't you? Yeah. The problem is that received medical wisdom doesn't have any strong evidence that it's true. So there's been um, several analyses of, uh, of the scientific evidence, and each and every time it shows that uh, a better approach for people to lose weight, become healthier, and even reverse things like type 2 diabetes is by following a low-carb, high-fat diet. You are seriously suggesting that the official dietary guidelines are making us fatter? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obesity has tripled and diabetes has doubled, and those dietary guidelines have not changed. So arguably, the healthy eating guidelines that have been set have caused the problem. These are some pretty strong claims. I need to get the other side of this increasingly complex story. The British Dietetic Association represents clinical dietitians and advises the government on health and diet. Dr Amanda Squire is their spokesperson in Wales. The low carbohydrate, high fat diet in very short bursts is not necessarily a problem. What we are concerned about is that there is a lack of substantial long-term evidence for its ease of use, its safety of use, and actually what the long-term effects are regards to your general health and your risks of car uh, coronary heart disease and obesity. The evidence for the current arrangements aren't terribly good either, are they? There is some discrepancies on all evidence. Research, as you know, is a group of people that will publish their findings. Different groups will find different findings. As dietitians, what we do is interpret that complex and often confusing information and put it in terms that the general popul population can understand and go on to, to carry out in their day-to-day -day lives. Well, we've had donkey's years of following the current guidelines. Would you say they're a success? They are a success because we we've have... got an obesity crisis. Yes, our obesity rates aren't ideal, but they're certainly not increasing at the, at the rate they were. We're never going to see dramatic changes. We're never going to see dramatic improvements because it takes a long time for research to filter through to the public. So how are we expected to weigh up all this conflicting advice? Anyway, my current diet experiment continues. So at the end of week two, 14 stone, I haven't put any more weight back on or lost any more. I'm, I'm stable. I'm missing things like fish and chips, uh, takeaways, and I'm missing eating lots of fruit, which ordinarily I would do. This regime uh, dictates that you can't eat too much fruit because the amount of sugar, but I'm managing, I'm, I'm getting through on this, it's not too onerous.
Losing weight is an awful lot about what you eat. Exercise is of course important, but you cannot outrun a bad diet, however many legs you've got. Here in Pembrokeshire, Jonathan Williams may have hit upon my perfect low-carb, high-fat takeaway. Lobster and some seaweed uh, batter. Lovely. Is that a secret ingredient? This is the cornerstone I've ever we cook with, which is the um, lard bread mixed with uh, Welsh batter. And we've been doing this for about, I don't know, four or five years. So we put the lobster in there. The lobster's just caught off the beach. I've always been a massive advocate of eating butter. I'm not sure about you, Jamie, but... Well, you spent 30 years being told butter's bad for you, and yeah. now, now it seems it isn't. So, it's quite interesting how it uh, turns around. So when they've been queuing up outside here all day, uh, thinking that this is really cool and really trendy, and I'm sure it is, but you're not doing anything new at all. I mean, they were doing this 100 years ago. They called it real food. It was free food. They, they got it off the, off the beach. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, you can't give away my secrets now. <laughs> it's tough, though, right? I mean, it is. I mean, it's, I think people are so used to, uh, I don't know whether it's media or what's happened in the last 30, 40 years, that people could kind of, you know, all these different diets coming out. And, and it's funny how it's almost turned full circle now, and we're kind of almost going back to where we were 100 years ago, before the big companies came in telling us what to do and what to eat and how to live your life. Just basic, good local food is, is, is simple. So how does it feel to be uh, the next big thing then, that you are it, you are the uh, low-carb, high-fat, trendy diet? Yeah, well, it feels pretty good. I do like my uh, bread rolls to mop up my uh, butter from time to time. I think, you know, I think everything in balance, everything in reason, and I think, you know, you should not be afraid of butter, you should not be afraid of these things, I think, you know. Are they all good? A healthy takeaway? Well, yeah. It's not possible, In surely. I would offer you some, but... Well, it's so good, isn't it? It's so lovely. You get to eat that every day on your diet, Jamie, or just... I wish I could. <laughs> so, well, it's so simple, isn't it? It's just yeah. fish, yeah. butter, yeah. cook. Yeah. People always say they're really confused about the food they should eat, I guess. The simple answer is real food, real food, not from a factory, straight from the sea in this case. Can the answer really be that simple? And if it is, then why is it not the basis of government advice? With so much criticism of the government guidelines, the question that begs answering is, who's behind the dietary information we're bombarded with? Professor David Miller from the University of Bath is an expert in this subject. So who actually advises the UK government? Scientific committees, which are uh, uh, made up of uh, working scientists uh, from the universities in this country, uh, and they advise the government on the best uh, science on nutrition questions, and they advise the government what to do about that. That's how it's supposed to work. But of course, there are informal influences uh, by corporations paying scientists to do research, which can distort the evidence base. The other way in which the corporations influence is through the process of directly targeting uh, and trying to influence uh, civil servants, special advisors, government ministers. And they do that by meeting them directly, by uh, putting on events, by uh, funding think tanks to attract the minister to come and speak. And they do it also directly by uh, funding political parties. So what would you like to see change? Well, I think the key, the key thing is to, to remove the taint and potential corruption of corporate money in the whole policy process. The advice should be coming from scientists who, to the, to the best of their ability and to the best of our system's ability, don't have conflicts of interest which could adversely affect the kind of uh, advice that they give. When it comes to dietary advice, do you think we should be listening to the UK government? Well, if you want to listen to what the UK government says, you need to uh, ask the question, what underlies that? What science underlies that? And when you look at that closely, uh, uh, it's not the best science. One thing I am discovering is that there's no shortage of disagreement on diet. Governments of every complexion strongly deny that they're influenced by the food industry or that any advice isn't based on objective scientific research. But there are still many questions which I wanted to put to the people in charge in Wales, the Welsh Government. Well, nobody wants to talk to me. I had wanted to talk to the Chief Medical Officer for Wales and the Health Minister. They both work in this building behind me, but they have both declined our invitation to take part in this programme. But they have issued the following statement. They say, the Eat Well Guide is the UK's national food guide, which has been developed by experts 
and based on extensive evidence and forms the basis of Welsh Government dietary advice. They say it's designed to promote the optimum balance for a healthy diet, including in relation to starchy carbohydrates and fats. So there. Even though as a devolved nation, Wales has the power to write our own guidelines for public health. In this case, we are following what Public Health England says. Well, I've been following my own advice. My three weeks are up, and this is my moment of truth. Well, here's the big question. How's my cholesterol? It was a little on the high side when we started this experiment. Has it gone up or down after a high-fat diet? So when we started uh, this process three weeks ago, your total cholesterol level was 5.6. Yesterday, when we did this, your total cholesterol had gone down to 4.9. So I know I'm throwing figures at you, but basically what I'm trying to say is, surprisingly, even though you've been on a high-fat diet, it appears as though your cholesterol level has gone down. Wow, so how much of my belly have I lost? So the last time we did this, it was 104. We're still around about 104. We haven't really lost anything around your abdominal circumference. That's a downer. Eh? Well, what about my weight? Hop on the scales then, Jamie. Do you feel brave enough? Okay, here we go. So you were 94 kilograms when we started. We're now down to 88 kilograms. Well done. That is the result. Three weeks on, what do you conclude? It would be very difficult for me to say whether it has done you any damage or not internally because I have no way of finding out how your liver, your heart, your kidneys are doing after this diet. What it's done is made you lose a considerable amount of weight. So for anyone who is contemplating a, a, a regime change like mine, what would your advice be? They need to come and see either one of our doctors or the practice nurses, take advice, be followed up, be aware of the dangers, the positives and the negatives of any diet, not just this diet, and take that all on board before they embark on it. This low carb, high fat diet may not be for everyone, but it seems to have worked for me. I've lost the best part of a stone. My cholesterol has dropped and I feel pretty good. The one thing I've taken from all of this is to be more aware of the food I eat. I spent my whole childhood not eating any greens. The irony now of having to eat lots and lots of greens. Which is very nice. But the reality is, I still have weight to lose, and so does the majority of the population in Wales. We eat too much, we eat the wrong things. But confusing, contradictory dietary advice is a serious contributory factor in our big fat problem. And that is serious food for thought. Welsh football is on the up and former Wales striker Dean Saunders talks to people at all levels of the game to find out what they think will keep it that way. Keeping the Euros dream alive is at 10.40 tomorrow night here on BBC One Wales.